Ezra chapter 9 this morning. Wasn't that wonderful? I'm glad the old rugged cross still makes a difference this morning. It has changed my life. It has changed me. It has brought something into me that I couldn't have without the old rugged cross. And I'm going to tell you today that that's where salvation is found. That is where repentance is found. That's where forgiveness is found. Is at the cross of Jesus Christ. And I am so thankful for the cross. I tell you, through church and through times, and we've changed so much, but I'm going to tell you, God hadn't changed. And uh, salvation is the same as it's been for thousands of years. It's still at the cross of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that the cross can make a difference in you today. If you need a change, you can, you can find it at the cross. If you need salvation, you can find it at the cross. If you need the forgiveness of your sins, I promise you, you can find it at the cross. Where would we be today without the cross? I don't know how others make it through who never go to Calvary as I do. I don't know where I would be today without Jesus, but I'm glad He did what He did for me. Let's stand this morning for the reading of God's Word. Are y'all glad to be here today? Are you glad to be saved this morning? I'm so thankful for what he's doing in this place. Ezra chapter 9 and in verse 1. Now when these things were done, the princess came to me, saying, The people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abomination, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites, for they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice I rose from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees, and I spread my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up into the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in great trespass unto this day. For our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hands of the kings of the land, to the sword, to the captivity, and to a spoil, to confusion of face, as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God. Isn't that wonderful? but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolation thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. And I pray, Lord, that you'd have a blessing upon it. I need your help this morning. Lord, I need the leadership of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that souls will be saved. And I pray the saved will be rekindled this morning. Lord, I pray that we would come to you for forgiveness of our sins. But I pray, Lord, that when we do, you would give us the strength to turn away from those things. I love you and I praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to go back to verse 8. I think I skipped some there. And I want to get the Word of God right this morning. Of everything that's perfect, it's right here in our hands. Let's go back to verse 8. It says, Now for a little space, grace had been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, to give us a nail in the holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us reviving to set up the house of our God, to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, the repentance of Ezra. Last Sunday we talked about forgiveness and how we need to forgive, how we need to apologize. But this morning I want to speak on the subject of 
repentance. Repentance is used many times and illustrated many times. In the New Testament, the Greek word repent means to change one's mind and purpose, to reform, to have a genuine change of heart and life from worse to better. When we say repent, when we say repentance, it simply means to turn our back upon one life to turn to another life. When we get saved, we repent. That means we turn our back on our old life to face the new life that we now have in Jesus Christ. I want you to know that this word repent or repentance is used 64 times in the New Testament. This is a subject that is used over and over again. And you will hear quite often in the Baptist church when it comes to salvation, talk about uh, asking for forgiveness. We talk about praying that prayer. We talk about asking the Lord to save our soul. But one thing that we must never leave out is the importance of repentance. I want you to know that if you're going to be saved today, you must repent of your sins. I want you to know that if you're going to be right with God today, you got to do more than just say, God, I'm sorry. you got to say, God, give me the strength to turn my back on those things that you oppose today. I want you to know getting right with God and being saved is so much more than just saying, God, save me. It is truly coming to a moment in our life that we empty ourselves out to God and we say, God, here's my past. Here's my sins. Here it all is. I put it in your hands. Help me to turn my life around. I am so glad today that God don't just change us, or excuse me, save us, but He can change us this morning. I want you to know that salvation is a life-changing experience. You should not leave the moment of salvation the way that you got there. I'm glad the very moment and day that Jesus saved me, that He changed me. Because in the midst of salvation comes true Repentance. The Bible says even uh, in the book of Acts, it says in the times of ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Understand today that we are not suggested, we're not recommended to repent, but we are commanded by God to repent of our sins. I want you to know in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2 that John the Baptist, speaking of him, he came preaching the message, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This man came and preached repentance. When the Apostle Peter got up over and over again on the day of Pentecost, the, uh, the, the heart of his message was that the people would repent of their sins so much more than just say a little prayer, but that they would go to God and get saved and get changed at the moment of salvation. Even Jesus said many times in His ministry, He commanded us to repent. Two times in the book of Luke chapter 13, He said, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. May I tell you, if we don't repent, we won't go to heaven. He said, if you don't repent, you will perish. I don't want to perish. I want to go to heaven. I don't want you to perish. I want you to go to heaven, but most of all, most of all, God wants you to go to heaven. And He wants to save your soul. And understand today that salvation is more than repeating after the preacher. It's more than saying the words. It is a believing in our heart that God can save us, but also that we can turn from those sins and that God can forgive us of our sin. Let me tell you something. If God has the power to take our sins away and forgive us, may I tell you, He has the power to give you to walk away from those sins sins and to walk away from that life. Salvation is so much more than just prayer. It's a turning away from the old life and turning to the new life that we now have in Jesus Christ. That's the old life. That's the old creature. That's the old Josh. The very day that I met Jesus, He gave me a brand new life. He gave me a brand new song. He gave me a brand new smile. Everything with Jesus is about the newness of life. There's a lot of of us and I've been there in my life and I'm still there oftentimes that I want to hold on to the old life, that I want to hold on to the old Josh, but friend, God saved me and God changed me. I got to let that go and I got to turn away from those things and I got to turn to a life now that I have 
in Jesus. I want you to look here in this story. We find Ezra coming home from Babylonian captivity and Ezra and Nehemiah both were men that God used to lead a group back uh, from Babylon. But they were used in two different ways. Nehemiah was used to help restore Israel physically while Ezra was used by God to help restore Israel spiritually. And when they come back from Babylon, Babylon, or excuse me, Israel was in bad shape physically, but they were in worse shape spiritually. And this is what Ezra is addressing here. And if you notice the sin of the nation, number one, in the first two verses, he said, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abomination, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in their trespass. God told the nation of Israel long ago, as you go through these cities, as you go through these places, you're going to encounter all kinds of people. He said, when you go through here, you can live among them, you can go about your life, but he said, I do not want you marrying into these other countries, unto these other nationalities. And it was so much more than just another nationality, it was another culture. Because within these cultures, all of these cultures had their own God. Okay, And every time that Israel would get mingled among these other people that were not Hebrew, they would always fall to their gods as well. And they would, they would take up their culture. But friend, uh, God had a plan with the nation of Israel. Number one, through their seed, He wanted a Savior to come. And He wanted to protect the seed of Christ. And He wanted to protect the seed of Israel because through that seed and through the seed of David and through that seed would come a Savior in Jesus Christ. And He wanted to protect it. But He wanted to protect the people from the false gods in the world because every time that they married them, they would take up their religions and they would turn their back against God. And so now they're coming home, they're getting back into Israel, and Ezra the preacher stands up and he says, Listen, Listen to me. Y'all have sinned against the Lord. What we have done and what we're coming home to Israel with is sin. It's sin. And I want you to notice that the man of God stood before them and he called them out on the sin that they had committed. Why was this sin? Because God had told them many times, do not do this. Do not marry those other nationalities. Do not go to their gods. And so since they did this, they sinned against the Lord. The nation had broken the law and the instruction that God had gave them. Friend, when God says do this, this, then you do it. If God says don't do it, then don't do it. And if we disobey God, it's called sin. When the law of God is broken, it is called sin. Sin is the breaking of a law. It is the inability or failure to follow the law of God. John said, for sin is the transgression of the law. How do we know how to please God? How do we know if we're a sinner today? Because there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. There's 1,050 commandments in the New Testament. Don't say you don't know how to live. Don't say you don't know how to please God because God has laid it all out for us. And because we have all of this, if we do not follow this, if we do not obey this, that means we have broken the law. And if we've broken the law, we have committed a sin. And if we have committed a sin, you know what that means? We are sinners. And as far as I know, I hadn't found one person that lived up to this, except for Jesus. <laughs> but other than Jesus, everybody in this room has not lived up to this. And Ezra came to the people and he said, listen, we have broken the law of God. You have committed sin. Now I want you to think about it. These are families. They've had kids. I mean, here they are coming back and he's telling them they've done it all wrong. Could you imagine how mad and upset they must have been? Man, could you imagine how many feelings that preacher hurt that day? 
Man, you think I get it bad sometimes. I imagine they were on Ezra that day. I can't believe you called us out, friend. I thank God for men of God and women of God who look at the law of God and they call sin, sin. They call it what it is. Let me tell you something. If we have broken this, we have committed a sin. We can butter it up. We can pretty it up. We can put a band-aid on it. We can ignore it. But sin is sin and sin has got to be dealt with. But sin can never be dealt with if we don't acknowledge the sin that is in our life. I thank God for men like Ezra that went before the people and said, listen, you have transgressed against the law of God. You have sinned against God. What you have done, you have broken the law of God. And God is not happy. Let me tell you something. We need to call sin, sin. Well, preacher, that ain't politically correct. I don't care what politics think, amen? amen? I don't live life to make everybody around me happy. As a child of God, we ought to live to satisfy the Savior. We ought to live in a way and in a manner that only God is satisfied with us. Friend, sin is sin. Well, preacher, times have changed. Friend, God hadn't changed. Amen. Well, preacher, you just need to know the day and time we live in. Friend, the Word of God is still the Word of God. This isn't a book of recommendations. This isn't a book of suggestions. It is a book that is expected for each and every one of us to follow. Well, I don't want to follow it. Well, you're going to get judged by it. And we will be judged by our sins. You know why our nation is going the way it is? Because we are scared to call sin, sin. Well, I may hurt somebody's feelings if I do. Friend, if you don't, you're hurting God's feelings. And you're letting God down. Let's call it sin. If it's sin, if there is something in our life today where we have broken the law of God, let's go to God and let's acknowledge it. Let's acknowledge what we've done. Let's quit sweeping it under the cart. Well, if I just sweep it under the rug, man, time will go by, friend. No, God doesn't work that way. If you've broken the law of God, it's got to be dealt with. But first off, we've got to acknowledge it before we can deal with it. The United States of America needs to wake up. And we need to acknowledge our sin before the Lord. As individuals, we need to acknowledge our sin before God. Let's quit ignoring our sin. Let's quit sweeping it under the rug. Friend, let me tell you something. We need to deal with it today. And the first step of dealing with it is acknowledging sin. I want you to notice the shame of Ezra. Notice verse 3. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Notice verse 3. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and I plucked off the hair of my head and my beard and sat down astonished. Now, most of us read this and we think Ezra's done lost his mind. <laughs> that preacher got up there preaching, and he got down and he's plucked his hair out. Man, man, this man was crazy. But when he heard how the nation had treated God, it broke the heart of of this man down. There was shame on the life of Ezra. The nation of Israel had broken the law of God, and when they broke the law of God, it brought shame upon the man of God. And the man of God felt shame before a holy and righteous God that the nation of Israel had done God the way that they've done. Now I want you to notice what he did. He plucked off his beard. He, he ran his mantle. And all through the Bible, we're, going, we're fixing to look at another scripture where they did this. But all through the Bible you find this. This is a picture of shame. This is a picture of mourning. When people have sinned and they've messed up, they got to the place of shame. Where it was a shame for them that they did and treated God the way that they did. And it brought shame to their life that they treated a holy, righteous God in that manner. It brought shame to them. Now I want you to hold your... Uh, let's look at one more verse and then we're going to look in Jonah. I want you to look over in verse 6. And this is the man of God. And he said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to Thee, my God. This man was so broken down with the sin of the nation that it ripped his heart out and it brought shame to his life that he was even bashful to go to God. He was ashamed to go to God and face Him in prayer of how they've treated Him. You know, we're so different in that sometimes. Because we go live life the way we want to, and sometimes we say, God, here's my life. You just deal with it. Huh. You just deal with it. I don't, I'm not ashamed. But Ezra was ashamed. Because he broke, broke the law of God. 
The nation of Israel had broke the law of God. Now hold your place there and look with me in the book of Jonah. If you're with me, say amen. amen. The book of Jonah. And I know this is one of these sermons, you know, we don't like to hear it because <laughs> it hurts. But friends, sometimes we need it. Amen. And sometimes we got to get our toes stepped on a little bit so that we can get where God wants us to be. Because at the end of the day, we want God to be satisfied with our life. But if we hadn't turned from our sin, I want you to know God's not satisfied. Now in Jonah chapter 3, the most wicked nation in all the world has just received a revival. They're getting saved. They're repenting of their sins. And I want you to notice in verse 5. It said, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For a word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king of his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. We see an evil, wicked nation that got their heart right with God. And when they got their heart right with God, it brought shame to their life for how they treated the Lord. The most wicked king in all of the nation took on his robe. He took all of his robe. He took everything that he was and he took it off because he understood and realized that the Jehovah God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that this king had let him down. And this king had broken the law of God and because he got saved and he got right, he repented of his sins and it brought shame to him. He took all of His glory and He laid it down to show God how ashamed He was for the life that He lived. Now, we have gotten to the place, and this is all through history. You can see it and trace it. We have gotten to the place where I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. And how dare anybody say anything. And this is what we've come to. Well, people can't judge me because God is. God's the judge. Friend, we're right. We are correct. God is the judge. And we don't have to worry about what other people say because God is the judge and God will judge us. But friend, that ought to open our eyes. That ought to open our hearts. Well, you know, this is my life and I'm going to live it the way I want to live it. And I don't, hey, I don't feel bad at all about what I've done. I don't feel bad at all about my lifestyle. You know, there was a, a day in time when if you did not live life according to the Bible, it brought shame to your family. I remember times that if you didn't do the marriage thing right, you know, if you didn't do it according to God's will, that it brought shame. And, and people used to run and hide because it brought shame to their family if they didn't do it the way God appointed them to do it. But now, how dare anybody say anything because this is my life and I'll live it how I want to. Friend, we must get back to a place of shame in our life and in our sin. Don't get to the place where you're so hard-hearted and cold-hearted that your sin doesn't break you down. Your sin ought to break us down. If I've let God down, it ought to break my heart that I've treated a holy and righteous God in the manner that I did. If you remember, Ezra told the people, he said, listen, God has been good to us. God has brought us out. God loved us. He showed mercy to us. He revived us in our bondage. He has done this and He has done this. And in return, this is how we've treated Him. You say, preacher, why should I feel any shame in my lifestyle? Because, friend, God has done nothing but love you. Are y'all with me this morning? God has done nothing but love you. He's done nothing but shower down mercy upon your life and grace upon your life. And everything you need to live, you can find it in the Lord. Amen. Let me tell you something. How dare me to break the law of God? How dare me to live a lifestyle in opposition to the Word of God? Now this message is not a popular message, I know. Because our nature hates this kind of message. But let me tell you something. God has laid it all down for me. How dare me that I live in opposition to the Word of God. Let me tell you, America, can I remind you where God has brought us from? Can I remind you the greatness of this country? 
There used to be great pride in this country that this was the greatest nation on earth. But we have been overcome by our sin. We can't even call sin, sin anymore because you may hurt somebody's feelings. And we don't care what God thinks about it anymore. Friend, we ought to care. Because God cares today. God cares about our life. He cares about our lifestyle. If you are living in opposition to the Word of God, don't just go to God and say, God, I'm sorry. Feel remorse. Weep over your sin. It ought to rip your heart out for living in disobedience to the Lord. I grew up in a preacher's home. I thought all the time that my dad was listening to my conversations. Man, he'd get to preach and I'm thinking, boy, he's listening to my conversations again. How dare him get on that telephone? He wasn't doing that. God was telling him what to preach. God knew exactly what I needed the time I needed it. The Holy Spirit was dealing with me time after time saying, you don't need to live that way. You don't need to do those things. You need to give it to me. You need to let go. You need to serve me. Let me tell you something, child of God. You can't serve God without turning away from that old life. You've got to turn away from it. You've got to turn your back on it. I want you to look back in our text and we're going to be done. If you're with me still, say amen. amen. Ezra chapter 10. Oh, the shame that it brought the man of God. He couldn't... He, Oh, he was bashful. He was ashamed to even lift his head up to the heavens because it brought such great shame. I wonder if we feel any remorse about how we live our life. I wonder if we feel any remorse about how we've treated God. Well, there's one thing I know. Regardless of how we've treated Him, He's been mighty good to us. He's been faithful to us. Ezra 10 in verse 1. Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And Shekinah the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered, said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and we have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. I am so thankful regardless of what we've done to break the heart of God. I'm glad there's hope in our sin today. I'm glad there's hope in our life today. Notice verse 3. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord and those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. I want you to notice last the separation of the people. The sin, the shame, and the separation. Friend, when you acknowledge the sin, there must be shame. It must break our hearts of how we've done to God. But there must come a cutting of those ties to sin. There must come a turning away and separating ourselves. Friend, they told their spouses to go. I could not imagine how hard that is. I could not imagine they sent their kids away. Could not imagine what they went through that day, but they had to in order to please the Lord. We don't have instruction quite like that anymore, praise the Lord. It's a little different, but there's still laws. There's still God's expectation upon us. And if we don't live that way, we must get ourselves in a manner that we're now living that way. I believe the church has got to the place where we're scared to call sin, sin. Back in the 40s, I was reading the history book of Promised Land. And back there in those days, man, they just they called it what it was. And I seen where uh, a bunch of people of the church got caught uh, dancing and drinking in the community. So they come forward and they apologize. And they got right. They got right with God. They got right with the church because it brought shame upon the church. It brought shame upon the Lord. And I believe his brother Hollingsworth at the time was the pastor. And apparently there was confusion. He got up one night and he said, Listen, across the board, if you have done something in this town that has brought shame upon this church and the Lord, you need to walk the aisle and get right tonight and apologize. And the minute said, the majority of the church walked the aisle that night and got right with God. But if you keep reading down the road, they had revival. And they had 30 and 40 souls get saved in the next week or two in revival. 
And I go through the minutes and I see, that, you know, 20 apologies that morning, 13 apologies that morning, 20 rededications, and then the next week they'll have 20 get saved. Unbelievable. But we've gotten to the place where we think, well, that's the old way. Everything's better now. Friend, God's Word is still God's Word. And we've got to apply it appropriately. And if there is something in our life that He is not pleased with, we must change it. We must change it. If you're addicted to alcohol, may I tell you that He can change your desire. If you're addicted to drugs, I'm glad that God can change your desire. If you are in a relationship or in a lifestyle that God does not approve of, He can change you today. And I've heard it said many times, there's no hope for that one. There's no hope for that one. There's no hope for that one. I'm glad in Jesus there's always hope. The Bible said that when He called it out for sin, they said there is hope in this. I'm glad we've got hope in Jesus. I'm so thankful that God can forgive us. But He can give us that power to let it go and to turn our back. This is what repentance is. It's turning our back on one life to turn to another one. Friend, if you've never been saved, would you be saved today? Oh, there's a holy, righteous God who loves you and wants to save your soul. He wants to redeem you and bring victory to your life. All you've got to do is humble yourself. Repent of your sins and be saved. Church, let's not forget that little word, repentance. Let's not forget that. Amen? It's important in this church. It's important in the Word of God. You 60-something times in the New Testament. Jesus, He preached. He hammered on repentance. Turn, turn, turn. Church, we need to turn from anything that He's not happy with. And we need to satisfy the Savior. Oh, how many stories have we heard? How many times the men that walked in churches that nobody would even let them in they had hair everywhere. They looked like a hobo. They looked like drug addicts. And that time they come in, the Holy Spirit of God worked on them. <laughs> Spurgeon had a similar story as a kid when he walked in and the Holy Spirit began to preach. When the man of God got up and preached out a song, or Isaiah, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. And there's that little old boy. <laughs> that just come from an awful lifestyle, an awful home, got a hold of that boy that day, and God changed him. God saved him. No telling how many thousands of souls came to be saved because of his preaching. I'm glad God is a saving God, but I'm glad He's a changing God this morning. He can change your life. Let's stand very quiet, very reverent. And as Miss Jennifer plays, I want to ask every head bowed, every eye closed, if you need to be saved this morning, would you come? Let me show you how to be saved. Walk the aisle right now. These altars are open this morning. If you need to repent, if you need to pray, fall down where you are. Come to these altars. Let's get things right with the Lord. Let's repent. Let's ask Him for the strength to turn away. If you need to join this church, let's do it right now. If you have a public decision, come right now. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. As she plays, y'all come.